Hi guys, Hubs and Arbs here. Welcome to a lore video on the Mind Flayers. This time we won't be looking at any overarching perspective of the Illithids, instead I'll be showing you some of the most interesting Mind Flayers throughout the lore of Dungeons and Dragons. Now it may well be possible that you disagree with this list because I'm only including 5 Mind Flayers and this is largely based off of my own opinion and how interesting I think they are. I've based this off several factors ranging from their uniqueness to their contribution to lore. Also, I just want to say that it's a shame that Larian have pushed the release of the Early Access back to the 6th of October. I'm actually out of the country on that week, typical, but I'm going to bring my laptop with me and try to play it when I'm away with a headset microphone, so I'll definitely still be doing videos but there may be a bit of sound quality issues. If you haven't seen some of my other videos then I do a lot of lore videos on Baldur's Gate 3 and I've put a link to some other videos you might like in the description below. Okay, let's go. Number 1. Lugribosk Lugribosk is not your average mind flayer, in fact he is altogether quite divine. Spoken about in the Illithiad by Bruce R. Cardell in 1998, Lugribosk is the proxy of the deity called Ilsensin, the greater deity of mind flayers, some of which believe that Ilsensin is their creator. However, I'm not going to delve too deeply into Ilsensin in this video. Lugribosk is usually sent as Ilsensin's proxy when the god wishes to assist a particularly powerful mind flayer with the task. Lugribosk's form is normally that of an Olitharid, however when Lugribosk is enraged or in battle, he can call upon the power of its lord and transform into something far more terrifying. Lugribosk becomes 30 feet tall and its nails on its hands and feet turn into huge black claws. The creature retains its tentacles which also grow to a huge size. Lugribosk is an important part of Mind Flayer lore as it is mentioned in the Astramundi Chronicles. These chronicles are ancient and of unknown origin. They try to explain the Mind Flayer origins but scholars have doubts to their veracity. In the Illithiad we can see the following quote from the Astramundi Chronicles. A race of bastard children hidden beneath the world by their progenitors refused to go gracefully into oblivion. Instead, marshalling their strength and bound together by their mutual hate for their creators, they mastered mentally latent powers resulting from their mutant heritage. Led by the strongest minds amongst them, Illithid and Lugribosk, the mutants rose unbidden and utterly destroyed their creators. These creatures took the name of one of their heroes and spawned the Illithid race. Now, what this text implies is that the Mind Flayers are simply mutants of another race and that there were two leaders, one called Illithid and one called Lugribosk. The reason scholars take issue with this is because no other source has ever mentioned Illithid as the name of a person. Nevertheless, it is an interesting bit of lore in D&D that is deliberately kept vague. The origins of the Mind Flayers is something that no edition of D&D has ever definitively set out, and I think that I like it this way, as it keeps the mystery alive. However, I'd love for Lugribosk and Ilsensin to be explored more in 5th edition. Number 2. Methyl L. Videnbelp If you're a fan of R.A. Salvatore, then you may have heard of Methyl L. Videnbelp, who was an Illithid that served House Benre in Menzo Baranzen. Methyl came from the city of Fan Linksal, which was in the North Dark, situated underneath the Lurkwood. Methyl served Yvonnel Benre as an advisor, and this was part of a deal to save Fan Linksal from a drow invasion, and in fact Methyl proved very useful to House Benre due to its psionic abilities, which were primarily utilised against House Oblodra, who used to be a strange house in Menzo Baranzen, fascinated with psionics. It was even rumoured that in the book Menzo Baranzen 1992, that the drow of that house was sent away to train and maybe even breed with the Illithids. Methyl was certainly good at giving the impression of being loyal to House Benre, and it was also believed that he was a double agent in the city, but his use to Yvonnel Benre usually helped to further her own interests even if having a powerful Illithid that high up in an advisory position was at the detriment of the wider men's of Baranzen. In 1339 DR, Methyl's city of Van Linksel was in fact destroyed by Druzduerden and his companions, which triggered Methyl to start a group called the Sept Three Gact, using the ruined city as its base. They wished to remake an Elder Brain and reforge the city. However, Methyl lost control of the group when he was badly injured whilst accompanying the drow attack on Mithril Hall. Methyl disappeared after this injury and a mind flayer called Galgast assumed control of the Sept also attempting to re-establish the city of Fan Linksel. In more recent times, Methyl is still in the service of House Benre, serving Quenthil Benre, the third daughter of Yvonnel, and the new matron mother. 
By 1484 DR, methyl had grown in power immensely and existed more in mind than body. It was also insane, but it wasn't clear whether this was down to its great power or the injury that it received during the drow attack on Mithril Hall. In an interview with Christopher Perkins in 2019 over at Gamesbeat, Perkins was asked, Is Methyl L. Videnvelt the most notorious mind flayer in the Sword Coast? And in response he said, In so far as this mind flayer figures prominently in the Drizzt Saga, however, most inhabitants of the Sword Coast wouldn't know L. Videnvelt, and that's probably for the best. Number 3. Relaying the Occultical this Illithid was in fact an Alhoun, who originally hailed from Orindal, one of the most ancient mind flare cities in the whole of Toril. Alhouns have achieved a limited form of lichdom, and according to Volo's Guide to Monsters, Alhouns try to find a path to lichdom quickly through the use of arcane magic, which is forbidden in the majority of Illithid sects. Alhouns were largely seen as abominations due to the fact that they did not want to join with the Elder Brain upon death. In fact, they attempted to break the cycle of Illithid life entirely by extending their own. We can come across an Alhoun in Baldur's Gate 2, who is implied to be one of the leaders of the Mind Flayer sewer base. You may have missed it, but it does say, No, my army is not yet complete, when you enter. Relayan also has an indirect link to the Baldur's Gate franchise, but he is not actually in any of the first two games. He is a member of the Twisted Rune, which is a secret cabal of liches and undead spellcasters, largely based in Kalim Sham, but with a powerful influence over most of the lands of intrigue. They secretly controlled half of all the noble families in Kalimsham and were immensely powerful. Relayan was the right hand to one of the ruling members of the Twisted Rune called Priamon Rakesuk, a human lich originally from Water Deep. Priamon was a rune master and one of the leaders of the Twisted Rune. We can come across two other rune masters in Baldur's Gate 2 called Shangalar and Sheressa. Now, Relayan played a very important role in his master's plans in the fact that the Alhoun managed to get the secrets of gate construction from Halastar Blackcloak, who was an insane wizard that lived in Under Mountain. In fact, you can explore Under Mountain in the 5th edition campaign Water Deep Dungeon of the Mad Mage. The gate construction that Relayan stole from Halastar allowed the rune to easily create portals between two different planes of existence. The traditional spell method was often wrought with consequences that when cast would drain you of life experience or of energy in general. According to the 2nd edition Lands of Intrigue box set, Relayan had fashioned a lair in the subterranean ruins of the Vorpal Tower in the Forest of Mir. Its lair is linked to at least three other Twisted Rune meeting places via gates. In fact, it is my belief that when we step through this portal in Athkatla to find the Twisted Rune, this is in fact one of these gates that Relayan discovered how to make, as in response to us asking where we are, Shangalar says, Athkatla, hardly. The portal is known only to my creatures, and yet you had a key, a rogue stone. What did you hope to accomplish by trespassing in my chamber? The Lands of Intrigue box set also states that Relayan wants to become a ruling member of the Twisted Rune in a decade or two, and although the Twisted Rune has had no mention in 5th edition, it could be that Relayan is now one of its leaders. In the 4th edition Forgotten Realms campaign guide, it says the following on the Twisted Rune. Events and alliances in Kalimsham have long been influenced by the Twisted Rune a group of powerful undead spellcasters led by a mysterious figure who wears a corrupted version of Kalemvor's symbol. The Cabal meddles in mortal affairs for power and amusement, and it has forged alliances with Dinazi leaders in both Kalimport and Memnon. The spellcasters control a handful of still-functioning portals leading to places across Faerun. They have hundreds of agents, most of whom don't know their ultimate masters. Number 4. Thakwam the Quam is interesting because this Illithid is an example of a good Mind Flayer, or certainly a redeemed one. Now, I referred to all the Mind Flayers so far as it because they are actually genderless after the process of Ceremorphosis, and in lore are usually only referred to as it. However, in the 3rd edition book of Exalted Deeds, this Mind Flayer is referred to as a she. I'm not sure what's going on there, but maybe the writers wanted to make her more relatable as she is an example of a good Illithid. Anyway, Thaquan wasn't always good and she used to have Jurigar slaves under her mental control, but she was the victim of a slave rebellion whereby the Jurigar that she had previously enslaved forced her into a wretched life of servitude for three years, almost bringing her to the brink of starvation. Eventually, she was freed by a band of adventurers that killed her Jurigar masters but allowed her to live. Showing her kindness that she had never seen before, she eventually joined with the adventurers and travelled with them for two years before then joining a monastic order. 
where she swore a pact of non-violence, insisting on turning any evil humanoids onto the path of good and redeeming them like she was redeemed. Her place in law is not one that is particularly big, but perhaps it is significant. There has been a lot of talk online about the nature of the mind flayers in Baldur's Gate 3, and maybe some could be good or at least redeemable like the Quam. Number 5. Gideos A warning here for some minor spoilers ahead for the comic book Infernal Tides. Gideos is a mind flayer that like the Quam has a small amount of lore but might be relevant to future 5th edition material. We first see Gideos in the comic book Infernal Tides, which is written by Jim Zub and details the adventures of Minsk and Boo as well as their companions in a trip through hell to save the city of Elturel. The comic is all canon and so if you're wondering what happened to Elturel during the campaign descent into Avernus, then check out that comic. Gideos is a very unique mind flayer in Infernal Tides and he is in charge of a group of marauding pirate types called the Blood Rovers, who traverse Avernus on the hunt for soul coins. Soul coins were minted on the third layer of hell, Minerus, by Mammon, and they were infused with the soul of a single creature that was eternally tormented within the coin. They were used as currency throughout the nine hells. Gideos runs a crew that appears to be made up of goblins, Jurigar, gnomes, and ogres, and they move across Avernus using special ships, and seem to only be there hunting for riches rather than being evil. Unlike other mind flayers, Gideos seems fiercely independent and willing to take risks, acting more like a human than an illithid. The crew seem blindly loyal to Gideos, even offering Minsk and one of his companions the chance to oath up with Gideos and earn a few coins for themselves. Ultimately, the band of raiders seem more of the roguish archetype than overly selfish and greedy. They are in fact willing to help save Elturel, this could be more down to the fact that they can see themselves earning a great amount of riches in doing so. Anyway, Avernus will be one of the first points of call in Baldur's Gate 3, so it'll be interesting as to whether we see Gideos and his band of blood rovers during the game. Okay, thanks for watching guys. If you enjoyed this video, then do please give me a like and subscribe. There are loads more mind flayers out there, and many of the ones which are spoken about individually have some pretty interesting stories to them, so do check them out. Maybe you can go on the Forgotten Realms wiki to find a few more. I'll see you next time. Bye!